All right, here we go, guys. <clears throat> and welcome back to TWIP. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Joining me this week to discuss some of the cool things happening in the world of photography are Mr. Silarina and Miss Valerie Jardin. 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 <laughs> wow, you almost got it right. <laughs> Hi, Frederick. Hey, Sil. Somewhere in there is interpolation of Jardin and Jardin and... Something, you know. I just don't have the throat muscles to make that sound. I'm you're, not due, you're due for another trip to France, I'm afraid. <laughs> That's all France, it takes. Sign it right. me up. Right, Valerie. When I was in France, I got it right. You right. Did. I had you it. Did. See, it was the, it. The, it was the air. <laughs> no, it was being around all the French people that were pronouncing things correctly. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, guys. Welcome to Hi. the show. Hey. It's great to be yeah, here. It's good to have both of you. So we're going to dive right into the show. Here's uh, some cool things to talk about, and then at the end of the show, we'll do the sort of what are you guys up to stuff and all that. Um, before we jump into this, I want to thank our first sponsor for this episode of This Week in Photo, and that's our good friends over at FreshBooks.com. Also, this is the last time that we'll be doing that uh, intro, because the next one will have live ad reads in it all the way through. All right, here we go. Hi, Suzanne. Okay, here we go. All right, uh, coming back. All right, guys, uh, let's jump into story number one, and it's about gear avoidance syndrome and why it might hurt your photography. So basically, the gist of this story is, let me read the story. So we've always talked about how getting... Uh, the latest and greatest gear won't necessarily make you a better photographer, but gear avoidance syndrome may actually, will it actually make you better? So avoiding getting gear. So we talk about gear acquisition syndrome or gas, but gear avoidance syndrome, will that make you better? And who better to have on the show than Valerie and Syl? Oh, Valerie, I want to start with you because when we talk about this stuff, so you know, the, the context of this is you go out, many photographers go out and they're like, okay, I'm going to Paris, so I'm going to load every lens I own, because I don't know when I'm getting back to Paris again. I'm going to bring all my strobes, I'm going to bring all my, my lenses and backup bodies just in case my camera fails, and then batteries and chargers, and then you're loaded down. And then what happens is you get analysis paralysis, or you know, whatever you want to call it, paralysis by analysis, and you don't, and you end up missing shots because you have to make all these decisions before you can make a shot, and you're like, ah, screw it, I don't know, whatever, on to the next shot. You go in the opposite direction with your Fuji cameras, right? Because you have one lens, <laughs> one lens to choose from for the entire trip. And you've been doing this for, what, a year and a half, two years now? Oh, at least, yeah. Yeah, so tell me about that, because you went from, you transitioned from commercial commercial photography where you were using DSLRs and lenses and all, multiple lenses and strobes and all that to one fixed lens body. Tell us about your, your journey to that. Well, even, even when I was still shooting with DSLR, when I traveled, I only limited myself to one lens for my personal work. So mm -hmm. uh, for me, that wasn't a big, uh, that wasn't a big transition. Um, to switch to the Fuji with the 23 millimeter lens that you can't even remove anyway, so you have no yeah. choice. Uh, so that that's fine. And I I've written a lot about um, the power of limitations, mm -hmm. and um, and I really think that on any given photo walk, unless you're working for a client, of course, or you're shooting a wedding and you need two camera bodies with lenses attached at all times or whatever. But if you're shooting for yourself, you're probably better off just going out with one camera, one lens. I favor prime lenses uh, mm -hmm. because if you if you go out with that super zoom, like, I don't know, the what is it, the travel lens that goes to 300 millimeter, um, mm -hmm. then you might as well just stand in one spot all day and shoot it all. <laughs> <laughs> that defeats the purpose. Um, I think you're better off um, working a little harder with a prime lens. And I've noticed on, on, on workshops that even if people like to bring a travel lens with, there's at least one day during the workshop where I will tell them, okay, just leave that at the hotel, bring your 50. That's all you're going to shoot with all day. And that slows them down, and every time they make much better work that day. Just because yeah. it slows them down. I want to come back to that, because I'm, I'm on the fence about that. Because it's, uh, 
<clears throat> it sounds good, and I agree with you. It sounds, you know, it's awesome and liberating to go out there with one lens because you're limiting yourself, and it's less stuff to think about. Plus, you can, you can form that muscle memory, but you know, behind what the lens is actually going to capture, so that you can, you can make the shots easier in your head. But then, what about the shots that you miss? So, still, like, you heard what Valerie said, you know. So you go out there with that fifty, and you're like, okay, I'm cool. That's all I need. Or you're Fuji with a fixed lens on it. It's all you need. And then you come, aco- you come across this awesome landscape that you're like, man, I, if I had just brought my wide-angle lens, I would have been able to get that shot. You know, how do you reconcile those two things? Or, you, or do you just give up and say, you know, I'm not worried about landscapes today. I'm only, I'm only taking shots that will work in this particular focal length. So, so both, both approaches are you know, equally compelling. You can certainly say, I'm going to go out with this lens today, and immediately as soon as she said 50, I'm thinking, well, it depends which body I have. You know, if it's a 7D Mark II, that's really like an 80, but suffice it to say, I'm trying to sort out what that, you know, focal length is going to be. So sure, you can go out and say, I'm going to shoot the heck out of this lens today, and I'm going to make this work. Um, if you find yourself in that situation, you want to shoot the landscape, then, you know, Spray and pray and stitch it together when you get home is another mm-hmm. option. Um, mm-hmm. Although, you know, the size of cameras, I mean, let's, let's, let's suffice it to say, what are we really talking about? Two years ago, I had the chance to go to Cuba. I think we talked about that in the last show. Yeah. And uh, I took my son, Vin, who's a great shooter. So, bet- you know, it kind of, in between the two of us, we didn't have two completely redundant sets of gear. We had one and a half redundant sets of gear. So between the two of us, we each had one camera and we had one spare figuring that if one of our cameras went down, we absolutely, because we were in Havana for a week, um, we had to keep shooting. So I think it really depends upon the circumstance as well. Um, And it certainly depends upon the size of the camera. Being a Canon shooter, you know, I'm still a holdout. I love the EOS M form factor. It's a little bit bigger than a, a deck of playing cards. Um, and now that they've got the the M3 out in or coming out in Asia, I'm thinking, well, let's see, who can I call in Japan to get <laughs> them to buy that body and send it over? Because the reality is, if you have the camera with you, because it's small, it's in your pocket, it's around your neck or whatever, you're going to stand a chance to shoot. And I think a lot of us, that's certainly what the mirrorless revolution has taught us, is that if you've got a smaller camera, you're more likely to carry it even to the cafe if you're just going to get a coffee and something incredible might happen while you're there. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's I go both ways on it. Um, I think the bottom line for me is, of course, to be sure if you are traveling, if I was going to Paris, um, you know, I'd make sure that I had redundant gears. I'd hate to get over there and have one camera completely crap out or I have a battery charger that died. You've got to think about what is it that I could live without and what if it, is it that I truly can't. And I think that makes the distinction. Yeah, yeah, and, and I agree also, about the having a backup camera. Um, yeah. because that's happened on my workshop where you know the participants traveled for a few days before the day one, and their gear was stolen or something. And you're and talking so, about me, Valerie. I know you're talking about well, me. No, <laughs> you lost all your all your uh, power cords. <laughs> my batteries, my chargers got the chargers. got, got jacked that's at the right. airport. Yeah, that's right in London. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know um, those. Bits. But but things can happen. So having definitely a backup camera when you're on a big trip, that's the smart thing to do. It doesn't have to be your favorite camera, but at least you don't you, you don't have to go out and and spend three times the amount to to buy the equivalent. Mm-hmm. For sure. But but really, I I think it's about ha- not letting the gear get in the way and and making it more an extension of your vision. And not constantly being debating, okay, should I switch? Oh, maybe wider would be better here. And I mean, yes, of course, for street photography, that's a no-brainer. One camera, when one lens is all you need all day. You don't need to. You don't need a zoom lens. Uh, but but for any types of photography, I find it very liberating. And um, but limitations don't have to necessarily have to do with the with the gear. You can set limitation, and you know you don't need to. Uh, s- spray and pray, and, and maybe put more intent in you know in in your photograph before you press that that shutter, and and think more about composition. I, I really do think that digital has made people a little bit lazy, uh, and we tend to shoot way more than we need to, and not put as much attention to 
um, to the to the composition. I mean, I don't think any photograph, any you should never press the shutter without, you know, being almost sure that this is going to be the shot, um, yeah. and not just rely on oh, I'll take twenty shots of this and maybe one will be good, and. Mm -hmm. It's just, yes, that will work, and chances are you will get one good shot of the 20, but what satisfaction do you get out of it? I think it's taking the art out of the in a way. Yeah. Now, what about, so it sounds like we're talking about two different things, like both of okay. you guys. So there, there's the idea of backup, you know, and making sure that you have the gear to, just in case Murphy's Law strikes and something happens and you lose something or it gets stolen or broken or whatever, but then there's the other side of of making sure in your head that you have all the lenses to cover w any potential eventuality they may, that may be thrown at you so that you can get the shot no matter what because you're going to be in a strange location. So, like, Valerie, we're on your workshop, and, you know, we were shooting. I remember I was shooting macro shots one day, and then, you know, we're at the Louvre, and I'm shooting pyramids inside and outside and then we're over here you know so there was like all these different things to shoot while I was there I don't know if I would have been able to get it with just a fixed lens but on the other hand looking at your shots you were able to get everything <laughs> with I, just your one camera I think if you if you limit yourself you're going to be more focused and less scattered mm -hmm. um, I, I think Whenever you're on a, a, look, a new location, especially, um, it's all it can get overwhelming, and you try to get it all, but you won't be able to do that if you just try to limit yourself, um, whether it's with a lens or a theme or whatever. Just those limitations will will keep you more focused. Um, yeah, it's I mean, so hard, though. I mean, it's easier said than done. Because I was at I was at this. Uh, we're going to talk about it later in the show, but I went to this haunted castle yesterday and did some shots there, and I'd never been to, this is Preston Castle in Ione, California. So I go up there, and, you know, and just like every other photographer on the planet, the night before, you're like, okay, which gear should I take with me? You know, I'm like, okay, it's a haunted castle, what do I need? Well, I'm going to be shooting models there, so I need these lenses, of course, but it's haunted and it's old, so maybe I want to do some macro type shots, so of course, I need my macro lens, and then what about this? So let me bring this lens, and you know, so and pretty soon, I remember, uh, what did I bring? With? I think I had three lenses, three or four lenses with me. But they, they're small lenses because it was the GH4. But still, it was like, you know, I ended up using, I think the entire time I used the 12 to 35. That was it. And maybe for one last shot of the outside of the building, I used a, uh, a super wide. But two lenses the entire time. And I kind of got away with one lens. But I had the other ones in there because I could not bear to not bring them, especially with mirrorless. They're like, they're so light. I'm like, why not bring them? Because they're going to sit in the bag anyway and just in case I need them. So what do you say to that? I mean, it's, what's the harm in the mirrorless world? Sil, you can take this one. What's the harm in the mirrorless world of taking these lenses with you when they're only this big and they weigh next to nothing right. anyway? So, you know, there's really no harm unless it just having so much gear, like, oh, my God, which lens am I going to shoot here causes That's you it. to not take the shot. Right, yeah. Yeah. you know, I, my argument would be, hey, if your camera's small and the lens is small, then lens up and take two bodies around your neck so that you've got the wide to middle lens and you've got the middle to long lens. Um, mm -hmm. In my case, on a full frame, you know, I love Canon's 24-105. It's like my Swiss Army knife. Um, it's got macro, so I can get in close. Yeah, it's not the sharpest lens in the world, but if you're going to have one lens and you want versatility, I think you really have to think through your kit and say, okay, if I'm going prime, then I'm going to zoom with my feet and I may have to adapt or just sacrifice some shots that I'm not going to get, um, where, which I think is a valuable lesson in terms of really understanding what your camera sees, what your lens sees, and looking for those opportunities. Um, at the same time, you know, if you're going to have three lenses, I'm thinking hot in house, I'm thinking, oh, it's dark. It's like, if I tried to change lens in a haunted house, somebody would come up and scare me, and then I'd right. drop, like, my lens, and it would roll <laughs> into the, you know, the bloodbath or whatever, and it's like, yeah. uh, No, don't. no, this, this was not, this was not like a ha Halloween haunted oh, okay. house with people in there. This was a, this is known as the most haunted place in America. 
Oh, good. It was like okay. a real haunted house where murders had happened before. So it was like so something that scared me while I was in that house. I would have just dropped my, all my lenses and run. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's it's just the same, right? It's like, I, you know, right? The lenses are small, but even still, do you want to take the time to change the lens? It's like. Um, you know, in that case, I would argue, hey, if the gear is small and you've got two camera bodies, then, like I said, just try to lens up in a versatile manner so that you can keep shooting as opposed yeah. to stopping and saying, oh, I've got to change the lens. I want to keep the dust off the sensor. I've got to do this and that. Oh, you know what? It's just too much of trouble. I'm not going to take it. I'm just not yeah. going to take the shot. I, I can, yeah. We have to couch all this in that it, it you know, I hate, the, I hate the phrase it depends, but it does depend, right? Because if you're going to... If you're deploying, uh oh, what was that? I think I heard a ghost in my house. Uh, if you're, de- <laughs> <laughs> they, they're attached. They're attached. Uh, no, it's like the grudge. Um, but if you're like going to, like, I don't know, you're deploying to, you're going to Africa on a safari with, say, Andy Biggs or something for two weeks. You're not gonna be. You're not gonna go to Africa with just your Fuji, right, Valerie? Well, I went to Iceland with my Fuji, so you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> All right, never mind. Still, Arena, would you go to Africa with just one lens? I mean, Africa? would you? No, you know. I, but that's a that I think that's kind of a different story. And of course, the question becomes: Are we going safari shooting, or yeah. are we going to do street photography in Mombasa, or you know, what are we going to do? The answer right. is the correct answer is yeah. It absolutely depends yeah. upon the circumstances that you're in. Um, you know, so it's there's no it, like everything in photography. There's no cut and you know cut and dry answer. Um, right. If I was going to Africa with Andy, yeah. If Andy was, because isn't he shooting Nikon now? So I couldn't even borrow his lenses. I'm not sure. I don't know. You know yeah. I, I heard that he was shooting Nikon, but anyway, um, you know. So it's kind of like well, I tell my students, it's like it's not how many speed lights you own; it's who your friends are. Um, yeah, you know, true. out on a shoot, right? So what do you got? Yeah, your bag that is absolutely true. And it's the whole point of being happy. If you're happy carrying a huge load on your back for five, six hours, go right ahead. You know, I wouldn't do it. That would ruin my day to carry yeah. extra lenses. Mm-hmm. And I feel like a happy photographer is a better photographer. If it doesn't bother you to carry extra gear just in case, you know, and it's usually just in case because you may not even use it, well, go ahead. You know, I, that's... Yeah, it all depends. That's that's the answer, really. Well, what about what about zoom lenses? Now, Valerie, you poo pooed the super lens, the super zoom <laughs> lenses at the beginning here. I, you know, I want to put it back to both of you guys. Why not have the best of both worlds and just instead of having a fixed focal lens, you don't need a super zoom. But like like one, the, my favorite zoom in the Micro Four Thirds is the Panasonic 12 to 35, which on full frame is equivalent to the you know the 24 to 70. Which is kind of a good medium range walk around lens, you know, and it's a two point eight constant all the way through. So why not why not use a zoom instead of the fixed focal length? Well, actually, that was my uh, my how do you say that my workhorse when I was shooting commercial uh, the, the twenty four to seventy Canon two point eight, yeah. and it's probably because I used it for work that once I decided to just go lighter, ditch the DSLR, ditch the clients. I just <laughs> That's just really going kind of, light, ditch the clients. Forget, forget <laughs> this, you know, this part of my life and just shoot yeah. for me. And so, who needs, who and, needs food and shelter? <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, it all depends what you do. I shoot for me only. So I want a challenge. And I think you're more challenged if you use a prime lens. To me, that's part of the fun, is the challenge. Just like now, I, I, and I think the whole point of the article was more uh, to slow down versus mm-hmm. just to become a gear minimalist. And uh, why are so many people going back to film? And it's because they they want to slow down. and they, they, are, they there, want... are there a lot of people going back to film? Oh, my gosh. In the street photography, everybody I know is buying film cameras. Yeah. Really? Oh yeah. Really? They're buying used stuff and yep. So it that's a big comeback and it's really to set some limitation and to, to experience something different and and uh, and when you you know, when you have to either pay for the processing or or do it yourself, uh, you think twice about, you know, the spray and pray approach, that's for sure. Yeah. And you'll pay yeah. more attention to every shutter click. And you'll do better work. 
Yeah, yeah. It, the, the whole thing is interesting. I, I'm still on the fence because I have a I have a good number of lenses um, for my Micro Four Thirds and for my Nikon cameras. Um, though I haven't used the Nikon lenses in uh, I think two years or so, a year and a half. They or may so. need some dusting. <laughs> they need, but I am I'm going to buy a speed booster, a Metabone speed booster, so I can use them on my other cameras. Um, but still, I wanted to I wanted to have you chime in on that Zoom versus Prime. I remember back in the day, Valerie's probably too young to remember this, but back in the day, there was the whole idea that if you wanted really good shots, you needed to use Prime lenses, mm -hmm. and Zooms were softer and had chromatic aberration and all these defects in there. So don't use Zooms unless you absolutely have to. Is that still true today, do you think? To a certain extent, yeah. I think that really? Zooms are way, way better than they used to be. Don't get me wrong. I mean... You know, all the computers they can use to engineer the glass and to build the lenses. Zooms are definitely better. But I got to tell you, my like, I'm you know still shooting parts like little speedlight connectors and stuff for Speedlighter's handbook. And so I, you know, I've got that 24105 which has macro, and then I've got Canon's 100 mil zoom um, in the L series, and it just that lens knocks my socks off with how sharp it is. Really. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like, oh, we might have to soften those skin pores because, <laughs> you know, it's like almost not a portrait lens because even at portrait lengths, it's that sharp. Um, wow. And I've got, you know, I've got an assortment. I've got a 50 and I've got the 85 and um, not the the only the only prime, L prime I have um, is the 100 mil macro. All the rest are just the generic gold banders. Um, but yeah, I still I still buy into that whether it's myth or, or reality. Um, let's face it. The, you know, I mean, to make a zoom lens, you're putting more glass in there. You're putting more machinery. You're putting, you know, more air and space and all these things that potentially could go wrong or that are going to degrade the image. But let's also be really honest about it. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. if you're going to show your images on a computer screen 100% of the time, chances are it doesn't matter. You know, if you're gonna, if most people who are gonna be looking at your work are looking at it not on a 27-inch iMac like the one I have in front of me, but if they're looking at it on their iPhone 5 or 6, you know, well, then probably having it's kind of like saying, oh, do we really need 4K? Well, maybe, but if mm -hmm. you're looking at it on a small mobile device, which is where a whole lot of us are looking at our photos these days, then maybe not. But if you want to have prints made, and when you want to have prints made, if you want to have them made big, then sure, you might need that sharpness and that resolution. So again, we kind of come back to the whole answer. Well, it really depends it on depends. your output, you know? Um, so it's a long-winded way of saying, yeah, zooms, I think, still are less superior to primes. But if you said, Sil, would you rather take a 24-105 or you know, that 100 mil macro, it's like, well, chances are if it's the one lens I'm going to have for a couple of days, yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. I'll take the versatility of the 24-105 um, over, over any of the primes. Over any All right, well, let's, let's, leave it, let's leave it at this. I'm going to ask you guys each one question. I have a feeling I know Valerie's answer to this already, but I'm still going to, Valerie, I'm still going to give you the courtesy of answering. <laughs> so, Sil, starting with you. Uh, you're on a you're on a, a tropical island like the mm -hmm. island of Lost or whatever the name of that yeah. island was, and you need to you at you you're the photographer you know right. you're in Gilligan's Island and you're the photographer you okay. need and you got to put your kit together you're gonna be there for an unspecified amount of time what do you bring with you? <laughs> <laughs> Quick, well, you got I'm, ten seconds. <laughs> yeah, can I do I have my battery charger? If so, can I like bring well, a Well, you'll have a solar charger, you yeah, know. You there, we go. there we go. Um, you know, if if like I mean sand's going to be an issue. I'd move the island to a, you know, close but um if it's the lost <laughs> island, just grab the wheel and turn it. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I I don't know. I if I had to pick an all-around camera right now, I'd go with Canon 7D Mark II. It's a brilliant little camera and it's not that heavy. And yeah, if I'm a single lens guy, I'm going to poke the 24105 on it and call it good. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't forget your memory cards. You probably need a couple of those. Yeah. Well, if I don't have a... Com it's like if you give a mouse a muffin or whatever, <laughs> you know, it's like, 
Oh, then you, you then you need the card reader, then you need the computer, then right, you need the right. printer. And or you, like Valerie said, if there's this movement towards film, just bring a film camera, right? Then you need, you the need the all your right? chemicals. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, you gotta have to make chemicals out of coconut juice or something. <laughs> I learned you can use coffee as film developer recently. Well, there. Really? Wow. Yeah. Huh. All right, Valerie, what would you bring with you? Uh, your Fuji, at first I can't. Your XT1. You kill me. You kill me on a desert island. You put me in a big city. I'll be happier, and yeah. I'll take my Fuji X one hundred S with. You're trapped on the island of Manhattan. What? Yeah, yeah it would well, have to be there? Manhattan. Okay. Today. All right. So, Valerie, your scenario is. It's the dystopian future where all mankind is gone and you're there and you need to document it in case you're rescued somehow. What camera do you have with you? Yeah, it still would be the Fuji. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and about uh, 20 batteries. <laughs> <laughs> Valerie with her Fuji on the set of I Am Legend instead of Will Smith. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And what All would you right, say, guys. Frederick? But what would you answer the same question? How would you answer? Oh man, I, I was trying to get away from that. Yeah. Um, I think I would bring probably my GH4 with my 24 or my uh, 12 to 35 mil lens, um, and I might bring my 25 macro with me. No, no, no. Just because I like, I like. I, yeah, I wanted to, because I might like the little details, like the close detail <laughs> things. I want to play around, you know? You know, uh, I, I'm now thinking that I want a 300 millimeter lens so I can use it to whack open coconuts. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Or just bring a sketch pad and draw everything, you know? You know draw a knife and use that drawing to cut open the coconuts. There you okay. go. There you go. All right, guys, let's move on. Uh, this next story I wanted to chat about real quick is about Nikon. So Nikon, this is a funny story, and I'm sure you guys saw this in the notes. So Nikon uh, has come out with a, <coughs> excuse me, has come out with a hot shoe cover. Now, you guys have had your cameras for a while, so you probably lost your hot shoe cover <laughs> that goes on there. I, I, what's a hot shoe right. cover? It's gone now. <laughs> <laughs> with your camera, so yeah. But it's a little thing that slides in your hot shoe to protect the contacts in there from corrosion and the elements and all that. They come with your camera, but it's a little plastic piece that probably cost about 0.03 cents to make uh, and manufacture. Um, but Nikon is coming out with a stainless steel version of that to slide in your hot shoe to make it look cool. It's got little divots in there and, you know, kind of blingy. Uh, and it's uh, 2,970 yen or 23 dollars. I'll pay the 23 bucks. Or this thing. <laughs> you would get this though. You put this on your camera. It wouldn't fit. Oh well, yes, it, it would. Fit. It might fit. No, it might I, fit. I, this is a this is a head scratcher for me. It you is. Know, I, it, it's a total head scratcher because honestly, Canon DSLRs do not come with those little plastic thingies. Um, mm -hmm. I think I have one that came with the EOS M. Um, so as a Canonista, I'm thinking, you know, and as a guy who like lives and dies by the the performance of his hot shoe from time to time, yeah, I, I've never had like the urge to say, oh my god, I have to protect this, you know. See, that's could... key right there. The the speed lighter himself is like I never, I've never had a reason to protect these contacts on my camera. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm looking at this on the screen, and I'm thinking, well. You know, can you like put? Can you get bling it up? Can you like put little fake diamonds in those holes? Or I I don't know. It's just a piece of decoration to me. It is. Um, you know, and I I saw some photos today that I think are relevant. It, I can't even remember. It was on Colossal or something, but an aggregator of creative content. And somebody was doing really good gifs of shots in in Tokyo where they mm -hmm. like blanked out all the street signs, all the ads, mm -hmm. and so all these marquees just went blank and, and they just rotated back and forth and it reminded me of like while America is a super consumer society my perception of Japan is that it's even more so right and yeah. if you know so if you and I are walking down the street as Japanese consumers maybe yeah we're interested in, in ways to distinguish and bling out our cameras from a yeah. practical perspective and maybe that's what this speaks to I don't know I'm just shrugging my shoulders because I've never. <laughs> I, I love my cameras, but I don't love them to the point where I'm really, really nice to them. I, I, you know, I looked at this thing and I'm think the first thing that came to my mind was, and apologies to anybody that purchased this, but 
the first thing that came to my mind is, oh, this is an idiot tax. Okay, so <laughs> the idiots have to pay for this because, you know, you have something to spend your money on. And it's like I put in the notes here, it's a, it's a question of, like, selling things to people with more dollars than cents. Right, mm -hmm. so why why do you need something like this? Spend it on something. I would rather put my money in the lottery than put it in here. Valerie, do you care about this stuff? I mean, is this something that you would buy to make your camera look more impressive to the thieves? It would have to say Fuji on it. No, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. I actually I was I was kind of scratching my head. Is like, do, what's on the? Yeah, the Canon didn't come with those little mm -hmm. black. Plastic thingies. I don't recall that. Uh, well, all but the of Fuji. Did. All, of, all of my Panasonic and uh, and Olympus cameras came. Well, with the them. Fuji do. Uh, they do, and but they still have the plastic thing that was there. Yeah, that's uh, what I have. Oh no, actually, though the X100S, I I I use that. I use the the hot shoe for the thumb, the little thumb grip. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that's where it goes. And that's what I use in there. So uh, just because it's it's more ergonomically uh, comfortable to hold the camera, but otherwise, no, I don't. I would never even put a a, a flash on there, anyways. So uh, I would have left the plastic thing on there if I. Yeah. yeah no. I don't yeah, even. I, have, you know, a lot of people. I think that's actually it's funny, but I've noticed because. <laughs> um, in street photography, it's mostly guys than more guys than girls doing street photography, and I've noticed the guys are really into the little gizmos, the little. They spend a lot of money on you know the little red um, shutter uh, attachment. Okay. You know the yeah, you probably those. have that. I don't. <laughs> you know I don't buy anything. But from it was like friend. a dime. Come on, it was ten cents. Yes, Come on. but why? <laughs> <laughs> Does it make a difference? <laughs> I see more it makes guys me feel spend good. money Come on. <laughs> on our accessories than than girls do yeah. on uh, on camera stuff. I thought that was really funny, but for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the equivalent of putting mud flaps on your car. Or yeah. <laughs> exactly. They're, they're no, not I accessories. Don't. They're tools. They're yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. yeah, they are, but you know. Makes you I feel better. I think they're both. I mean, speaking of that, speaking of tools that cost a lot of money, I put in the notes as kind of a, a parallel to this thing from Nikon is Apple's watch, right? So, you know, the, the Apple watch is coming out, what, next month? It, it starts at like 300 and something dollars, which I think is relatively reasonable for this thing. But the Apple Watch Edition version in gold and all that, or the Silarina version is $15,000 for a watch. Now, I don't know. You know, if I'm who this is for. Like, if I'm going to spend 15000 bucks on a watch, it's not going to say Apple on it. I'm sorry. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, maybe Rolex. Maybe no, Cartier. Not even then. Not even then. I, I mean, Rolexes are awesome, but I would be afraid to wear one. People you know? still wear watches? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I have one right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have my phone. But the kids that I teach don't. I mean, we are we are mem we are the last generation that will wear watches as yeah. a majority. We'll, I, we're the last generation that will wear dumb watches. I think the next generation will have smart watches, right? Because you won't be cool unless you have one of these Google or Apple watches on. That's what but I. They'll think. replace the phone. No, I think it'll augment the phone. Like the phone, the watch. The, you know, not speaking for Apple, but the watch doesn't the phone. I mean, it'll tell time, but none of the cool features work without the smarts of the phone behind it. So you got to have both, mm -hmm. which kind of makes you a target when you think of it, because you're like, a thief could be looking at you, and they're like, oh, look, they have a watch, which means they probably have an expensive phone, too. Let's go get, <laughs> let's go yeah. get that person. Yeah. So, now, I, haven't I, even, I haven't even looked at the Apple Watch. Is it waterproof? I don't know. Because if it's not, it would never work on my wrist. <laughs> Why? Know? Are you a waterfall? <laughs> no, I just, like, you know, I wash my hands, and, you know, being yeah. in, in the art studio a lot, and it's like I go to the sink, and I wash my hands and dry them on my shorts, but it's like my yeah. hands are wet a lot, and I never, you know, I wear an $80 self-winding watch that's waterproof to 30 feet, and yeah. it does, it gets the job done, right? It's like, oh, what time is it? Okay, yeah. there we go. It's a, and it's like the prime lenses of wristwear, right? It does <laughs> nice. one thing and it does it well. 
Interesting. This will be this next year is going to be interesting to see who adopts this new technology and who doesn't. I have no idea if it's waterproof, but that's a really good point. Because the thing that would turn me off, which I think they, in that announcement that they did a couple weeks ago, they said that the battery life was going to be 18 hours per charge on yeah, that. No way. Which we'll see, right? 18 hours. And I was thinking it better be at least 12 hours, right? So for me to even consider it, but 18 hours would be like That's ideal. That's like a deal that gets you from, me. You get up at 6 a.m. and you're good until midnight, right? So I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Enough yeah. about that thing. We'll all see. right. Um, all right, guys, let's move on to this next story. Uh, story number, I guess this would be three, our photographers see- sleepwalking into a photography Armageddon. So this comes to us from Amateur Photographer. And here's the here's what they wrote. Our our photographers sleepwalking into a photography Armageddon. That's the stark warning from the Royal Photographic Society or RPS and Photo Marketing Association after Google Vice President Vint Cerf, the father of the internet, recently warned of a digital dark age where data stored on computers will be lost forever. So you're speaking at a meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in San Jose, California. Mr. Surf said last month, quote, when you think about the quality or the quantity of documentation from our daily lives that's captured in digital form, like our interactions by email, people's tweets, and all of the World Wide Web, it's clear that we stand to lose an awful lot of our history. Turn the clock back 175 years when the emerging photographic trend of the day was more salt print than selfie. Photography pioneer Fox Talbot was busy churning out prints from the earliest form of paper photography, yet his work lives on today, bringing to life the or bringing history to life in an exhibition at Tate Britain that documents daily activities and key moments of the mid-19th century, such as the building of Nelson's column. So basically you're saying these days nine there's zillions of photos languish unsorted on your computer's hard drive, your phones etc., and their danger or in danger of being lost forever. So in the context of this week in photo, I wanted to put it to you guys. Valerie, you first. Do you, like, we, we've talked about backup strategies ad nauseum on the show, and the, the gist that comes out of that always is it's, it's almost an unsolvable sort of quandary type perplexing question because you we're creating more data than we have time or will <laughs> to store, you know, so what do you do with this data? In your specific situation, Valerie, you're doing these workshops all the time. You're generating a lot of data. Plus, you have a family and kids and all that. You're shooting them and generating that. And the podcast, which is digital data, you know, for street focus, you're doing that as well. Like, does it go through your mind that one day this just may evaporate and go away and all this hard work that you've done will be gone forever? I don't know. I always think that when it's on the internet, it's out there forever. You know, no. <laughs> it was like like this show will be out there forever. If whatever stupid thing we say tonight, it's gonna be out there forever. It's That's gonna haunt my... you when you when you run for president. They're gonna come back and make an attack ad based on this show. No, but no, I worry about pictures. Um, I mean, people don't print, and uh, yeah, I and and I I trust my backup strategies but who knows and it worries me you know what's going to happen in 30 40 50 years 100 years are we going to still have you know whatever's not well what's printed is it still going to be you know are the prints still going to be good and what's not printed where is it going to be are people going to be able to use that so potentially yeah it's uh it's scary. scary. I mean, we got services scary. like Amazon and Dropbox and all these guys where you can dump data on, but even those guys, they're humans that are running that. Yeah. There's no guarantee that that's going to survive the, the zombie apocalypse. You know, who knows what's going to be available. So what do you teach your, your students and your kids about yeah. data and how to manage it? Well, let, let's face it. This is not a digital conundrum. This is the photographer's conundrum. I'm thinking about boxes and boxes of photos of our sons we have from 20 years ago that are sitting in closets, and we think, oh, because I have these prints and because we have these negatives, somehow that's better, better than having you know six terabytes of photos on my desktop. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it is because I'm thinking, well, okay, let's say that I want to go find a photo of Tom's fifth birthday. 
where that funny thing happened or whatever. It's like, where the hell would I begin? It's not like those photos are indexed, right? Right. And then let's say hours and hours later, because, you know, you go look at one box of photos, well, all of a sudden it's like your life stops and you're going down memory lane because you're looking at hundreds of photos and reliving all those moments. Then you finally find that negative, and it's kind of like, I'm thinking about it now. I'm going, where do I go with a negative to have a print made today? Because everybody's like, I was thinking, oh, you run to Costco. No, I'm, I, you know, there's probably a way for them to take film and send it out to be scanned. And yeah. so, you know, film is that film. The whole film era is no better. And God forbid that you're like basement flooded where all your photos and your negatives were, or the dehumidifier went out during the summertime and all the mold set up. Um, there was there's lots of risk for film and paper based. Um, and so in a digital world, it is a risk. And, you know, I'm thinking, like, I, I still have a SciQuest reader. I think we've talked about this in the past. I've got, like, SciQuest 100 megabyte drives that I used yeah. years ago, and I'm thinking, I, I, yeah, I've got the reader, I've got the drive. I bet I don't have a stitch of software that can open those up. So what do you do? Well, you know, you back up like crazy. You, you know, you make geographically redundant backups. Um, and then I think you have to be religious, you know, and I don't know what the timeline is. I mean, it, it's certainly more than a decade, but I don't know what that number is. You know, images, files that, that I shot 10 years ago, I can still open. That's part of the risk, you know, that in, in the future our software is not going to be able to open the file formats that we use today, and that's why Adobe, of course, champions the DNG yeah. file format as an open source kind of thing. But I haven't run into that 10 years shooting, you know, in my case, shooting Canon um, digital for 10 years. I can still open the files from way back when. It just without. seems like, you know, maybe, maybe I'm missing it or maybe the service is out there right now, but wouldn't it be cool if there was like this digital mausoleum type service where you could go check in the data that you don't need access to? I know Amazon has, you know, cold storage and those sorts of, uh, or Glacier, you know, those sorts mm -hmm. of services out there, but kind of a white glove type service that you could go to and say, okay, all this data right here, I want it off of my local drives because I'm not using it anymore and I don't want to back it up. I want you to guarantee me, guarantee me that this will be in my family for X generations. Boom. Mm -hmm. And they, they take it, they sort it, they index it, and it's locked away in some awesome vault with guards and everything for the foreseeable future. You know, so that you could feel you could feel safe that once I'm done with all these stuff, all these all this stuff, I can take off, give it to these folks, and it's done, and I can forget about it. If I need it, I can go in there and for a fee maybe access it, but it's behind the vault, it's in the data mausoleum forever, and it's good out there. I mean, is there, you, Valerie? Have you heard of a service like that? Well, no, but even who who knows how long that would last? I mean, the images. Right. Go right. belly up in thirty years and well, like those services, everything. those cryogenic services, right? Where you could have yeah. yourself frozen if you have a terminal disease. <laughs> you can have yourself <laughs> frozen in hopes that someone in the future will have developed the technology to cure, unfreeze you and cure you, right? So yeah. you're, you, if you, but at least now when you get frozen until your brain ceases working, you have the peace of mind, and you know, knowing that okay. I am kind of safe, you know? Yeah. So, know. Well, I'm Thanks. kind of, you know, here and now person. <laughs> so, yeah. you know what? I'm going to enjoy my, you That's know, my photographs point. now. And, uh, you know, if they're worth something someday, well, hopefully the kids will know where to find them. And, and yeah. that's about it. You're I such a hippie. I love it. Like, you're <laughs> such a <laughs> I kind of you know. make pixels, not war, right? <laughs> exactly. There you go. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, guys, let's move on. This, these hours go so fast. Um, let's do the our listener Q and A. This week's question is from Andrew Antonio. He says, "Guys, I'm migrating from Aperture." And I'm looking at Lightroom at the moment. Every time I go to the Adobe website, I get pushed into the Creative Cloud. Is it a good deal? I only need Lightroom. Would it be better to buy it as a standalone license? Any views? So, what, what do you think? What should Andrew do? Should he, uh, <laughs> should he just buy Lightroom and be done with it, or does he need the, so, the cloud? Yeah, so, you know, I, as I recall, um, so my Creative Cloud license updated like a week ago, and it's like, 
what's this three hundred and sixty dollar charge, right? It's like, ow, you know, because last year I got the educator discount to EDU. Well, apparently that's only good for a year. Um, oh no. But anyway, or maybe that's the EDU discount, and I'm, but I, I don't know what it was, but it was a hell of a lot more than I paid last year. Getting back to the question at hand, just you know, go, for ten bucks, go to hover.com and register an EDU domain, and then go find it. <laughs> to have to have for ten bucks a month to have access to Lightroom and Photoshop um, is probably a pretty good bargain. Because what's what's a standalone version of Lightroom like eighty bucks? Something um, like that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, so your break-even point is, you know, eight months down the road. Um, I don't know, you know, if if pinch and pennies was really the issue, um, it's like the net present value of eighty bucks versus ten dollars a month odd infinitum. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, and and so there are still some things in Photoshop, but precious few that I can't live without. Um, so my, my suggestion, I mean, what I would say to Anton or Andrew. Antonio would be to get Lightroom. Don't get the cloud yet. Get Lightroom and use it. And then when you bump your head against the wall that you need something more, then make that decision mm. and see if you can't backfill with something else like Pixelmator or some other service. Mm. If that doesn't do the job, then go to the cloud. Go to Creative Cloud and get yeah. that. You don't have or to go to a friend's house. Or go to a friend's <laughs> house. Yeah. You know, you don't have to like. I always think I see people and they think about this this stuff like they have to. They're like Batman, you know. I need I need all of my tools available to me to fight any crime that comes at me at a isn't time. That, isn't that how we started the show, Frederick? Yeah, it is. It is minimalism. It is. Yeah. yeah. yeah I would say so just add. get Lightroom and be done with it. That's what get I have. Lightroom, be done with it. Yeah. I, I, I hate membership thing, anyways, because I. Know. I no, are you in the cloud? Do you have you have a no, Creative? No, no, I have Lightroom. That's all I need. I don't use plugins or anything. I just use Lightroom and I have it on two computers because I think you can have it on two different mm -hmm. devices yeah. and yeah. Uh, I'm good to go. So So you and don't I use Photoshop at all? No. Nope. I haven't since I don't even know what version that was. So can't even wow. tell you that would date me. <laughs> yeah, it's a secret. It's a closely guarded secret in yeah. the Valor. It's been a long time, actually. I opened it. The, uh, my friend opened it the other day, and I'm like, oh my god, I wouldn't even know where to start. Now, see, that's great, and your work is fantastic. So I mean, it's like, Thank you. but yeah, I, well, wonder... see, I don't do, I don't shoot landscape or anything, so I really would not have any need for whatever. Yeah. I can't get into Lightroom, and even then, I mean, most of. Most of the people I know use just Lightroom, and they do just fine. So. And, but, you know, the other side of that is they're not doing compositing or exactly. model retouching yeah. and yeah. all that stuff. They're right? photographers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, you're going to get some hate mail about that. <laughs> because people that shoot models and all that other stuff aren't really photographers, right? Well, only no, street then, photographers. Then, you know, no, 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 no. I, and <laughs> I don't only shoot street, and you know that. But right, um, right. I... I, if I had to do all this other stuff, which I used to when I used when I shot commercially, I sent that out to a human plugin. <laughs> it was yeah. just a guy. That's all he did. He was really good at Photoshop. You know, I sent everything out to him. I hate doing that kind of stuff. I like behind. I like to be behind the camera, not in front of the computer. Period. So yeah. five seconds per picture on in Lightroom is all I have to spend. I love that. Still, so you need to get that. <laughs> <laughs> Some students, no, there's zombies wanting to come in. I'm staying in here where it's safe. <laughs> I love it. All right. I hope that answered uh, Mr. Antonio's question. That was that was good. I mean, that's a good one because it's like you know, like we talked about at the beginning of the show. It's it's easy to get mired in gear acquisition syndrome or what was the what did we talk about at the beginning? Gear avoidance syndrome or something? Yeah. yeah. Um. You know, I think the, the bottom line for all of this is if you have a vision for what you want to shoot and the kind of things that you want to shoot, you can always add to it. I mean, if you need more gear, there's Amazon Prime, you know, funds notwithstanding. But if you need, you're going, you decide to go on Valerie's workshop to Paris, you can, and you're like, okay, I to go on this workshop, I know I've been shooting with a 50 all year, but I probably want to get a wide to take with me. Get it before you go in the workshop and then go or borrow it from borrow lenses or lens rentals and be done with it. You don't have to, you know, do the, do the just-in-time photography instead of the, okay, I'm going to build an arsenal that's at the ready just in case I need, <laughs> I need to pull something off the shelf. 
Yeah, and that, that, all costs, that all costs money. I mean, if he's all he needs is Lightroom, it's cheap yeah. enough. Get it and be done with it, and then you know, just get the next version when it comes out. But yeah, that doesn't yeah. cost you anything. You're such a minimalist. I love it. I love it. Even though you now have a Zoom H5, which I saw you post about today. Congratulations. Yeah, it's still in its box back there. You're still, by you're still lame. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Luddite. All right, Twip Army, if you have a question you'd like us to tackle on the show, just visit the website at thisweekinphoto.com and click on that Submit a Question link and send us your question or even leave us a voice message, and we will do our best to answer it or not answer it. Before we jump into the picks of the week, I want to thank our second sponsor for this episode of This Week in Photo, and that's our good friends over at lynda.com. All right, guys, let's jump into the picks of the week. Remember, you can pick anything to recommend to the TWIP Army as long as it is somehow related to photography. Valerie, I'm going to let you go first. What is your pick of the week? Uh, well, it's Lens Work Magazine, which is uh, published by Brooks Jensen, and it's celebrating its 20th year. And um, it's a bi-monthly print or e-version. I get the print because it's more than just a magazine. It, it's... It's almost a book. I mean, it's definitely something you, you're going to put on your shelf. And it actually comes in a really thick envelope so that it doesn't get bent. It, it really looks like a, yeah, more like a book than a magazine. And it's just beautiful. And I, I don't like e, I don't, I don't care for e-books, especially with photography. I like to have the paper version um, mm -hmm. for books. And having a magazine, it comes every two months, and I just love it. Um, and it's beautiful. They do a great great job it's super high quality they um, just a lot of different um, it's all genres of photography so there'll be some landscapes and street photography you know there you go and um, it's thirty nine dollars a year but you can also uh, they offer a special sample offer if you just want to order one to check it out you can do that and uh, I mean twenty years uh, that's uh, that's a long time doing a magazine and it's still very wow. uh, very successful where, where are they based do you know I think it, I think they're in Canada, if I'm not mistaken. Very I think cool. yeah, wow. Brooks Jansen is is a great guy. He also has a a very short podcast. Uh, it's called Lens Work Podcast. Mm -hmm. It's only like three four minutes every week, but it's always very um, inspiring. Um, he's a, he's a great uh, great guy. What can he talk about in three or four minutes? Well, he'll give a tip. You know, he'll answer a question, and it's always very well uh, very well done. I want to listen to that. I want to hear yeah. how he tackles it three or four minutes. He's probably like, you know, on the question of should you get Lightroom or Photoshop, you get Lightroom. Okay, see you next no, week. It's more of a piece. Of, it's very, um, it's, and it's, this magazine is all about the photograph. It's not about yeah. gear at all. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how Jansen approaches everything. It's, you know, he'll give um, a piece of advice or something he's learned in his career or something. So just tips uh, for a few minutes, and it's it's quite nice. I like it. I love it. Lens work. Awesome. How long have you subscribed to it? Oh, it's I just received my second one this week, and I'm just excited because uh, it's just, you know, you open a magazine, and it's just something about it because it's not something we, we get as often as we used to, you know. It's kind of yep. a rare thing now to get a magazine in the mail. Yeah, I know, I know. Very cool, awesome. Lens work, thanks, Valerie. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Sil Arena, what is your pick of the week? So, you know, I'm kind of going against the grain of how he opened the <laughs> show. <laughs> because today, Forget about gear, just don't get anything. And Sil yeah, is... No, today, today is like the day that a whole lot of us Canonistas have been waiting for because we can now pre-order the newest generation of Canon's 5D cameras, the, the 5DS and the 5DSR. These are the 50 megapixel DSLRs. And uh, I'm thinking, okay, let's see, if I can sell one half of my liver and one half of my kidney <laughs> um, and get a good price on eBay for both, uh, no, it, it, you know, these cameras are no more expensive than the 5D was or not significantly more than the original 5D I bought 10 years ago. Um, so B and H is booking orders now. They're not going to ship until June. But if you've been hot after the Canon 5DS or the 5DSR, today is the day that you can place your order and get at the head of the pack for delivery in June. 
Wow. And you're, did you order one, or are you going to? No, I had lunch with a Canon rep on Friday, and he promised I could borrow one for a while. Oh, nice. So, um, yeah. That does I, look pretty. It's a, I, I think for some of the things that I do, um, still life stuff, not speed lighting stuff, um, Actually, I kind of hit a wall recently making some big prints, and I want to make bigger, bigger, big prints. Um, yeah. You know, so like pushing stuff up to 2024. Because let's face it, here's the other side of it. You know, like 15 bucks at Adorama Picks gets you a 20 by 24 inch beautiful uh, print, and it's like. So the cost of getting things printed is coming way down, and if you've got a color-managed workflow, you can take advantage of these discount printers, and you don't have to go to a custom house. Um, yeah. But at the same time, if you want to have your images hold their resolution and go big, then maybe. Of course, that doesn't, you know, having a new camera doesn't do anything for the hundreds of thousands of images that I'm sitting on, but, right. but that's what I'm telling myself anyway, is that you know, going forward, it'd be a pretty nice thing to have. So now, now, you know, Valerie, when you look at this camera, are you thinking, you know, there's no way that I would ever go back to the giant DSLR now that I'm in the world of mirrorless? Or do you get, do you get kind of pangs of like, oh, uh, well, 50 megapixels? What couldn't I do with all those pixels? What do you think? No, not at all. You know, yeah. and I never really, that was never, I. I it was always a tool for me. I, mm -hmm. I never, you know, I never really had camera lust or gear lust. So mm -hmm. uh, whatever did the job when I was working for clients, that's what I bought. And I made sure my clients bought it for me. You know, I never went ahead and bought the greatest and most expensive stuff until I had the client's client base to, to pay for that. And, um, and then I upgraded when I needed to. I never upgraded ahead of time uh, or when something new came out. So... It was no problem getting rid of it. It didn't matter. Fair I never right. missed it, really. And you still don't miss it. You still don't no, miss no, your DSLR. Not at all. Never. I mean, I no. Actually, I can say that when I was in Iceland with the X100S only, uh, I kind of thought that having the, having the DSLR with a 70 to 200 could have come in handy at times. But uh -huh. I did yeah. not let it get to me, and I uh -huh. said, I have a great piece of gear in my hand. It's going to be challenging, but I'm going to make the best of it, and I was really happy. That was probably my best summer of uh, my best photographic summer, that summer. I did. Oh, I spent in cool. Europe with just the one camera with the fixed lens and, and made the best of it, and I had the most fun. For sure, it was the most satisfaction I've ever had out of photography was that That's summer. That's awesome. Yeah. Did you bring so, did you bring a, a computer or an iPad or anything with you to look at images yeah, or did you just I, um, say I'm just gonna capture and look at them when I get back to no, the state? I, I did. I uh, at that that time I probably already had the 11 inch uh, MacBook, oh, the MacBook Air. Pro. Yeah. 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 So, okay. Oh, the Air. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the Air. Cool. Awesome. See, that's that's always inspiring to hear professionals like you say that well, that they can do that. It's just that and you so, know I was the satisfaction. <laughs> Still saying, there's no way, and there's no way I would go to Iceland with just a mirrorless camera. Still, you would have a backpack full of stuff and a Sherpa, I bet, right? No, uh, <laughs> only if they were paying for the Sherpa. Um, yeah, an Icelandic no, Sherpa, they're expensive. I, I, let's put it this way: I would have enough gear to fill a day pack, and yeah, it would probably weigh about 20, 25 pounds. Wow. And um, you know, but. Yeah, that's a couple cameras and a versatile range of lenses and some speed lights, of course, and some speed light mods and uh. Yeah, and you're the speed you know. lighter, of course. This, yeah. Um, that was a family vacation for me too, so you know that's very different. And uh, I figured, had I had more gear, I would have been frustrated because mm -hmm. I wouldn't have had more time to do it. I mean, it was a family trip, so photography yeah. came second. Um, but even and security you know, concerns too, right, Valerie? Because you're like, okay, you you bring all that gear, you got to watch all that gear. You can't take yeah, it all with you on excursions, and you, people can steal yeah. it from your room. And there's that piece too, right? Yeah, but for me, it was just in that time when I was actually quitting working for clients, and mm -hmm. I went from professional to being an amateur again, and I was the most liberating thing in the world. And yeah. uh, and I was just so happy to just not have to work for anyone and just having to please myself and no one else that I was just you could have given me I don't know an old pinhole camera I would have been happy 
<laughs> All right, guys, let's move on. So my my pick of the week is, like I mentioned uh, earlier in the show, I went to Preston Castle, the haunted castle, um, yesterday, uh, last night, yesterday afternoon. Um, and uh, I did some shots there. So for the folks that are watching this, I'm going to show you what I used. So I used... The software I used is this, so it's called Cinemagraph Pro. So essentially what I did was, um, I the shot that I'm going to show you in a second, I went there and I set the camera up on a tripod and we had models and all that and I did a series of shots recording in 4K video and uh, then I took those took that shot or that, that video into this software, Cinemagraph Pro, which they, they have a Mac version and an iOS version as well. The Mac version is expensive and the iOS version is free or or very cheap uh, but what it lets you do is like if you can if you're looking at this video that's playing right now there's a giraffe in the scene that is looping and just moving back and forth from time to time and it lets you do things like that so you can take a video a high res video or even a low res video if you want and record a small clip and then paint the part of the frame that you want to move and only that part moves and it does intelligent masking so that you don't see the edges kind of blurring and flickering and all that so what I did was I went there and I did this shot here of a model sitting in this remember this is a haunted castle so this was the dormitory room in this boys home that some terrible things had happened in <laughs> so I decided how do you illustrate that? So I had the model in there, we had a little fog machine and the rocking chair. So to get the shot, I just set, told, put the model in the chair, had the camera on a tripod. This was a GH4 shooting 4K video. Um, I think I had my 7 to 14 mil lens on there because I wanted a little bit of distortion on the wood floor. And I uh, hit record and I had an assistant run in and rock the chair and step out of the frame and do that a couple of times. I brought that clip into Cinemagraph Pro and basically painted over the rocking chair, and that was it. And I exported this out, and we have this this video that looks like this. And that kind of stuff is is fun because it, it lets you add another sense of story to the images that you're that you're creating, not just a still. So, and it doesn't take any more gear than what you already have. You know, if you if you have a camera that shoots 4K, or in the case of Sill's new Canon, that shoots 1080, but it's okay. <laughs> well, that's really cool. Yeah, isn't it cool? You could do stuff like that. So, yeah, so I'm excited to the, to experiment more with this kind of software because it lets you kind of think about, okay, I have the scene. Like if you go to the if you go to the Flixel website, that's the company that makes this. It's called they're called Flixel. If you go to the Flixel website and look at some of the things that they're doing, it's just like cool things. Like someone pouring water, the whole frame is is still and only the water's moving. You know, and the cool thing about Flixel is, you know, people have seen these before in animated GIFs, but the Flixels are ultra high resolution, right? So you have these professional quality things, not just an animated GIF that's blocky and dithered and all that. It's like full on data in there. And it looks really, really cool. It allows us as image makers and storytellers to do some really cool stuff that's, you know, basically limited by your imagination only. So that is my pick of the week. It is uh, Cinemagraph Pro from our friends at Flixel and uh, Preston Castle. So I put Preston Castle as my pick of the week because yesterday, if you go to the Preston, Preston Castle website, we'll link to it from the show notes, or you can just Google Preston Castle in Ione, California. But they have a photo day where they open the place up for photographers. So you can go in there and shoot. And I mean, this place is... Like everywhere you turn and look in this place, it's another set. I mean, it's it's not designed to be a set, but it's like a run-down, kind of dilapidated, feels haunted in there. I mean, like, you got holes in the walls exp exposing rafters in there. You've got, you know, rooms that are dusty with crackling paint. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a paradise for photographers, you know, so... I would suggest if you live anywhere in California, make your way to Preston Castle and check it out because it is, uh, it is, it's one of those places where you're going to have to go back like 15 or 20 times just to feel like you made a dent in all the possibilities that are there for photography. So, so definitely check that out. And we'll embed the, uh, this, the cinemagraph that I made um, uh, at the castle yesterday. We'll embed that in the blog post for this episode. 
That's cool. I'm going to have an urbex special on Street Focus soon, so um, oh, cool. to give some tips about shooting, that kind of stuff. So. Oh, cool. Where are Not you Not necessarily. Go? Uh, well, it's a friend who lives in Detroit. What better place? But it will be all about what you need to know about urbex photography, you know, mm -hmm. safety and so forth. Not just Detroit, but in general. So I'm excited about so that. For, for, the, uh, for the folks that aren't as cool as you, what does urbex mean? urban exploration. So it's usually just photographing decrepit uh, buildings and abandoned things and yeah. So That's cool. It's, it's I really love cool. It. Yeah. And and usually street photographers I mean most photographers love that. I mean the more peeling paint and rust you you find the happier you are. So Yeah, yeah. And cool. for me, for me is like if you find that kind of area then you throw a model in there yeah. and it's <laughs> And you happen to have a fog machine, you know, it's all over. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, that's great. there all day, you know, just having yeah. fun. So, all right, guys. All right, before we before we end the show, I want to find out what's going on with you guys. What do you have coming up, Valerie? Uh, in the in the coming, let me guess, you're traveling all over the world again. <laughs> well, actually, uh, yes, Rome in April and Paris in May, and uh, yeah, then it's. Uh, I, all the workshops are pretty much full, except I think I have a couple spots for Minneapolis in June and. The last weekend in Paris in October still has a couple spots. Otherwise, it's, the whole year is already booked up. So I'm working on my 2016 dates so that, that I can so open cool. registration I so, soon. <laughs> I, I got to tell you publicly, I am so proud of you that you, because I've watched you go from the commercial shooter to in the, somewhat of a Luddite all the way through to embracing mirrorless and kicking the commercial stuff to the side you know, filling and booking your awesome workshops and hosting a very popular podcast Thank all you. in like 18 months or so, right? <laughs> That's and, just crazy. And Street Focus is that episode, I think we're 26, 27, so like it's that, yeah. doing well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. So recording a lot this month in preparation for the travels in the spring, so. Yep. Yeah, good going, good okay. going. Keep, keep on keeping on. You're doing a good job. Thank you. All right, Mr. Sil Arena, what about you? What do you have going on? So, uh, looking at summer, it's going to be a great, great summer. I've got lighting workshops in, uh, I almost said May, no lighting workshops in May, but June <laughs> up at Rocky Mountain School of Photography in Missoula, and July at Santa Fe Workshops, and in August at Maine Media Workshops. So nobody ever cries for me in the summertime because I get to go hang out in some really great places and teach people and how to... What do you to, cover... Is it is this? It, oh well, first the first question is: Is your book done? No. And are you covering some of the topics <laughs> that are in your book? <laughs> See how I'm laughing? Y'all still um, didn't mention it during the entire show. <laughs> no, you, we didn't have like opening comments. We skipped right to it, and you had to ask. Yeah. Um. So now the book's not done. I'm uh, six weeks away. May or five weeks away. May. You said is, that about six weeks ago. He did. Yeah, I did. He totally did. I did. <laughs> But I'm actually working, like I mapped it out. I was like, I think I can actually do it this time. Um, okay. <laughs> so, you know, I just continue to say that this, the new edition of Speed Letters Handbook amazes me. Not, uh, not because it's my book, but because I'm like, <laughs> there's a whole lot of stuff. There's like, I just did the chapter on small modifiers. There uh -huh. is some amazingly cool, lightweight soft boxes now. Um, you know, f-stoppers, flash disk being among them. It it's like it's I don't know. It's like a smashed peanut butter and jelly sandwich in your pocket, and it pops up and gets on your speed light, and it's this beautiful little 12-inch soft box. And nice. it's it's fun to find those things that weren't around five years ago when I wrote the first edition. At least I tell myself it's fun, right? Because then I've got to write about it, photograph it, and lay it out, blah blah blah. But um, now the book will be done before the summer workshop series opens. Um, and the workshops all have their kind of unique bent at each of the different workshop programs. But the common theme is I share my obsession with light and with how to create really interesting shadows because the reality is if you think you want to learn how to light, you really, really think you should think that you need to learn how to craft shadows because throwing light at something is easy. Crafting shadows is where the magic happens. I love it. Yeah. So here, here's a, a brain twister for you, Sil. So all right. What? You know what the speed of light is. What is the speed of dark? It's faster. Because <laughs> how did the dark exactly get there first? Same, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like, how did the dark get there first? Exactly. So. Exactly. How did the dark get there first? Yeah. Um, 
No, that's awesome. Congratulations on that. Thank so you. the book will be out, and the book is uh, coming so out when the, the workshops are. Go I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say. So when the workshop when the workshops are running, the Rocky Mountain School of Photography workshop, which is in June, and in July is the Santa Fe, and August is Maine, the main media workshops. By the time you hit those, the book will be out, mm -hmm. and you'll be working on the next revision to the book. No, nah. <laughs> maybe I should start five five years early. Uh, I'm gonna take a break. I'm gonna enjoy the summer workshops, and because uh, they are in three really great parts of the country, I'm so lucky. To have this I've office. heard really great things about the main media workshops recently. Actually, somebody yeah. told they're me to all, check them out. They're all they're all each different. They're all each incredibly unique and located in really really great parts of the world. Love it. Love yeah. it. Cool. Awesome. Well, congratulations on those. Thank you. And for me, um, I've got one workshop to talk about, and um, I think Craig Colvin has been on the show before. So Craig Colvin and I are doing a Joshua Tree Landscape Photography and Nude Model Workshop, and this is May 1st through 3rd in Joshua Tree, California. So we'll put the link to that in the show notes for this episode, and uh, yeah, definitely come on out to that. We'll probably be announcing some other things that are going to happen at that workshop relatively soon that we're working on, but definitely sign up now because we're only taking, I believe we set the cap at nine people, taking a page out of Valerie's book. <laughs> it's like only nine people on this workshop in Joshua Tree, so definitely come check it out and join us if you can. Is it male or female nudes? Uh, you'll have to go or a to mix. The to find out. It'll probably be a mix, but yeah, you'll have to go to the page to find out. What? Does that does that matter? Like well, you're only gonna come if know, there's a certain gender I can't, there? I can't go, but I just I'm just wondering because it could make a difference, you know, if a, a guy was to sign up or a girl. So yes. you know they may yes. have a preference. Yes. Just a, well I may be persuaded to become one of the no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I kid Twip Army. Yeah, I do not do that. Um, okay. All right. Well, we're at the end of another episode of TWIP. I want to thank our sponsors, FreshBooks and Linda, for their support of the show. Um, Valerie, what's your website? Where, where can people go to connect with you? Uh, it's ValerieJardinPhotography.com, all in one word, or at thisweekinphoto.com slash street. Love it. It's Your name is easy for you to say, i got to tell you. Silarina, <laughs> 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 what what's your website? Uh, pixelated.com is the best place. That's P is in Paul, I X, S is in Sam, Y L A T E D.com. Pixelated.com. Wonderful. All right. Well, thanks to both of you for coming on. It's always a, a it's always good to have you guys on cuz especially Valerie and Sil. Sil is the I'll take 25 to 30 pounds worth of gear with me and <laughs> Valerie is like, "Yeah, I'm taking one little camera and I'm happy. That's it." Right. <laughs> that makes the world it. go around. I know. That's right. Yin yang. All right, Twip Army, be sure to visit our website over at thisweekinphoto.com. We're firing on all cylinders over there. I think there's new content almost every day popping up from one of our hosts or more. And we've got new shows popping up all the time. Um, we've got a couple new that we're a couple new shows that we're going to announce in the next week or so that should be very interesting. I'm not ready to tell you exactly what they are yet, but uh, just stay tuned to This Week in Photo, and you'll find out. And with that, it is time to take that lens cap off. <laughs>